Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Ross. And you're right, I have a new book, okay? Uh, Better Capitalism is Now History. Uh, this is Burn the Business Plan, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it today. And Burn the Business Plan is really geared towards understanding entrepreneurship in a different light. Uh, to be here today with you all who are worried about environmental protection, clean tech, if I were to talk to an audience this big that we're all specialists, God forbid, in entrepreneurship, they would say one of the hottest areas, if not the hottest area, that they would direct their students to would be clean tech. But that's where they would end the utility of what they could talk about. Much of what we know about entrepreneurship is just plain wrong, and much of what is taught is decidedly wrong. Let me start by asking you all a question. Dream up in your mind the archetype of an entrepreneur. Who's floating through your head? Nobody my age, right? Somebody say something, hmm? right? Who is it? Somebody dropped out of college? Somebody has enormous backing from a venture firm? Somebody who might be uh, equipped with a bachelor's degree in entrepreneurial studies. Let me tell you two stories. The first is about a man in my book whose name is Fred Valerino. Fred wrote to me last February on a Saturday night, 11 o'clock. Fred writes, Carl, I've got another patent. Fred's 92. Fred was a first-time entrepreneur when he was 52. Fred's story is really interesting. And by the way, it's not atypical. And we're going to look at some statistics about entrepreneurs, statistics that nobody's ever really looked at before because we don't have an empirical footing about who these critical people are to our economy, which is what this book is all about. This book really is a condensate of 10 years of real research by real economists into who these entrepreneurs are. And why did we do this? Because entrepreneurs are too critical to economic growth to be trying to train them and pass on mythology as their inspiration. So let's go back to Fred. Fred was 52 when he started his first company. He worked for a company many of you have heard of. It's called Diebold. They make bank vaults. And along the way, when America suburbanized, they bought a company that blew tubes, pneumatic tubes. Whoosh, boom. When you drive in the teller and you put your banking slips in, that technology is as old as the hills. It began in Springfield, Massachusetts, in what was then a new innovation, a department store. A man by the name of Lamson uh, thought he'd clear the store, the clutter, of all these young boys who used to be cash boys who would run sales tickets in cash upstairs to his wife who would make change and run it back down. He thought he could streamline this and he started to carve out croquet balls and put them on ropes and he'd pull when the transaction was to go up and then they come down, sometimes hitting customers in the head. But he got rid of the cash boys. These cranial injuries caused him to think about something else. So he bought some gutter pipes and began to roll these balls back down to the clerks. And then one day he had this inspiration, likely from reading Scientific American, a magazine that Thomas Edison said he walked four miles every week to get, that in London they were blowing mail under the city by pneumatic tubes. And Lampson figures out that this is the way to handle cash transactions. He moves his company to Syracuse, New York, for reasons we don't know, except that it was an industrial hub and made steel. And the next thing you know, by 1904, he has installed 24 miles of piping in Harrods and another 18 miles of piping by 1908 at the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic is the first place, by way of innovation, where they stop surgery, blow biopsy tissue to the laboratory, 
so the surgeon knows what he's up to next. That technology, many people think of as ancient. Go into a Home Depot, you'll see cash being blown through the roof or across the ceiling right now. When Diebold said they were going to get out of the hospital business, because they were going into suburban banking big time, Fred argued and said, wait a minute, we're going to a cashless economy. You're betting on the wrong horse. We blow all this stuff around hospitals, like the Mayo Clinic 40 years ago, 30 tons of medical records. This is the future. They said, Fred, it's the past. You can take the company. Make the long story short, Fred runs a company called Pevco. He has a giant factory in Baltimore. He just did 86 miles of tubing at MD Anderson. This is a flourishing business, and it happened to a man who was 52. Now I'm going to show you a card that you all should have. Disclaimer, I'm on the board. This is MoviePass. Anybody got a MoviePass card? Great. Okay, we had a board meeting in Los Angeles yesterday. Our chief executive is 63. Huh? We're talking about a company that came out of Netflix. We're in California, maybe not the Silicon Valley, but this is one hot property. And the CEO is 63 of the startup? Uh-huh. Because what I'm doing now is starting to chip away at your vision of who entrepreneurs are. And the first thing I want to take you to is a consideration of the word entrepreneur. Oh, well, we have to stop there and just meditate on the beauty of this cover, OK? <clears throat> this is how bad it is. This book's been out three week, uh, six weeks. I got off the plane from Los Angeles last night in the uh, airport here at 11 o'clock. Looking through the rails, there it was in the bookstore, OK? So I took a picture and sent it to my agent. Uh, here's the use of the word entrepreneur. Now the point you take away from this small little graph is, if we do Google analysis of the word entrepreneur, you can see that 30 years ago, it wasn't in our vocabulary. When I started my first company, I was 38. I was a professor at Johns Hopkins. Last thing on earth I wanted to do was start a company. I'm an economist. My first job is Johns Hopkins. I'm an associate professor. I have a research center. I have $4 million of sponsored research. And as the representative said, two successive career scientist awards from the NIH. And when I saw this start to emerge on my desk, that I had the data that could prove that hospitals that ran more efficiently were more clinically efficacious, I knew I could write another academic article that nobody would read and nothing would happen or I had to start, morally, had to start a decision support company for hospitals. And I had to leave the university. It was a great trauma. I'm like a lot of entrepreneurs. The idea ambushed me. I didn't go around looking for opportunity like they teach in undergraduate schools of entrepreneurship. Opportunity recognition. Yes, I can be an entrepreneur, if only I have a great insight in an innovation. And pause here for a moment, because there are people in this audience who think you're going to be clean tech wizards because you're going to look around and see some hole in the fabric that you'll decide intentionally to fill. That's not how innovation works. It's not how great companies are started. It's the predicate for every business plan. You have to announce what your innovation is. But like me, and like Fred, and like Mitch Lowe, the founder of MoviePass, these ideas creep up on you. Most entrepreneurs didn't write business plans. There was no business plan for Facebook. There was no business plan for Apple. There was no business plan for Microsoft. There was no business plan for Duke Power. There was no business plan for American Airlines. General Motors, Procter & Gamble. What is this obsession with business planning? Well, we're going to take a look at this, and we'll move to the next slide, because this word wasn't even in use. Now, the next slide is going to be disturbing, particularly if you're a professor of entrepreneurship. 
you might want to leave the room. Okay, now you're going into hiding, okay? Looky here. Before we knew what entrepreneurs were, we had a lot more of them. The top line shows us that 10 years ago we had about 700,000 new businesses being formed every year. Now, tragically, we're under 500,000. We're 30% off where we were 10 years ago. What's happening? Well, it can't be that we're doing anything wrong here. We're ministering like crazy to this notion that we're going to start entrepreneurs. We're going to start all these new businesses. They're somehow critical to our economy, which they are. So we're going to plan them and push them and cradle them and incubate them. And by the way, we're going to have clusters. This is a word already used a great deal. Okay, color me skeptical about clusters being formed. Clusters are naturally occurring. That's how industry moves. That's how America developed. We had clusters all over the place, but not intentional. They were accidental. But let's take a look at this. So in 1980, across America, we had 12 people teaching entrepreneurship. If you went to the Harvard Business School, was there a course in entrepreneurship? No. Huge businesses were assumed. If you said to a professor, what's the history of General Motors? They'd say, Alfred Sloan. I used to consult for the Ford Motor Company. I'd sit in the cafeteria in the great glass box in Dearborn. I'd talk to all these MBAs. I'd say, tell me about the early days of Ford. No clue. It fell in from outer space. This building with 600,000 employees. Who cares? Henry Ford was once the only person on the payroll. And the Ford Motor Company only existed after he'd collapsed two other companies first. Bankruptcy was a critical part of these stories. So we had no professors teaching it. There was no canon. We didn't know what to teach. By the way, we don't now. What we teach now is some hodgepodge of strategic planning, ergo the written business plan, plus finance, particularly venture capital. And we'll get to that in a minute. But you can see here that it may be that professors are injurious to the rate of new startups. But then again, we think we have to have a lot of venture capital. I'm just taking a stab in the dark, but I'd bet $100,000 on this right now. There's a local venture capital fund in the research park. Because local indigenous money is critical to new businesses. Wrong. Uh, maybe it's uh, incubators. In the year 2000, we had 12 incubators in the United States. Today, we have 1,400. 1,400. 1,400. They're all staffed by full-time people. Most of them are paid for by government. And nothing's being incubated. The model doesn't work. We're not teaching the right stuff. We're not incubating. Our drive to create clusters may not be working. Having venture capital around doesn't work. And because I'm an economist, of course, I'm looking for causes. And perhaps, maybe we're overregulating. Those pages in the Federal Register is our index of how much regulation exists in the society. And as we'll look back later, there's one other force. And that is, when you have a depressed economy, it's much harder to start a business. Some of you will remember two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, economists, not like me, but the other guys, were telling you that 2% growth was the new normal. We would never see growth past 2%. And incidentally, you might know that there's a subtext to this in the world of power and energy and clean tech. There's an entire group of people who either consciously or subconsciously believe that all economic growth comes at the extreme cost of degradation to the environment. So there's often a subconscious dampening of the drive to growth because it's going to be bad for the environment. Now engineers, of course, know how silly that is because we can solve most any problem. Uh, I'm going to go to this slide and talk to you a little bit about the breakdown of who entrepreneurs are. 
because we go through life with this vision that they're monolithic, reflect back on what I asked you, right? What is your vision of an entrepreneur? He, because there are no girl entrepreneurs, is young. He is a dropout of a technology program, an engineer who doesn't have a bachelor's degree because he couldn't wait to get out of college. Very high tech and an enormous amount of support from the venture capital world. And sorry to say, he's not in North Carolina. Where is he? He's in Silicon Valley, right? That's our vision. Now that vision accounts for less than 1% of all entrepreneurs. And by the way, that particular subset over here, which I call aspirational hopefuls, they're in their early 20s, they have the absolute highest rate of failure. So if you're a mom and dad, and there are a lot of older people here, and you've got Jane or Johnny dying to be entrepreneurs and take entrepreneurship courses, stop them immediately. It is a very risky career. And it's not how it happens, and nobody can teach them. We have an improvement in five years of survival with combinational inventors. These are people who actually, with a few years, begin to see how things can be brought together. Now, let me illustrate this point. Having judged many undergraduate business programs, I want to tell you what the problem is here. Uh, uh, contests, excuse me. If you judge these contests a, a little while, you'll see the same ideas recur again and again and again and again. Perhaps at the moment, the most recurring idea that's so red hot, it's quite incredible. I have it in my book. People are ginning up a app that's connected to an electric frying pan. And when you put your eggs in it, if you have an Apple Watch, after two minutes or three minutes, when the eggs are ready, your watch tells you, this is really cool, right? Is a more complicated way to cook an egg than any time in three or four millennial. Are, are here, okay? But this is quite typical, and it happens again and again. This with programs, app programs, as to how to manage tennis courts at the University Tennis Stadium, how to manage parking for football and basketball games. They recur again and again. How to get pizza to your dorm room at 2 a.m. And as you think about this, some people are smiling, what do undergraduate kids know? One reason we're able to synthesize and as we watch this, we're going to watch the age of, of success go up and up. That is, older entrepreneurs are more successful. And we're going to come to a realization that people who are successful entrepreneurs, indeed people who start businesses in the United States, are old. The average entrepreneur in the United States is 39 years old. Remember I said I started my first business at 38? I was right smack in the bullseye. And people who start their businesses 40 and 50 have higher rates of success, as we see. Over here, oops, I'm sorry, whoops. Oh. Huh. <laughs> da -dee da -dee da -dee da there we go, okay. Over here, we have what I call breakaway entrepreneurs. They're in their 40s. That's the average person. Their five-year success rate is 65 plus. So if you wait, you're going to be more successful. And the reason is you're going to have a more synthetic ability to see what's really needed. Let me tell you something about these folks. They've worked on average for somebody else for 15 years. So when they're 39, they have enormous industrial experience. They start businesses usually in the industry in which they are working. They know a lot about how business works. They know the innovation cycle in business. They can observe the holes in the fabric with great clarity. Moreover, they have more resources. Most entrepreneurs fund themselves. They don't go to venture capitalists. And further, they are actually paid off in terms of their student debt. They don't have the burden of worrying about what they have to do by way of other obligations. This goes to the point of how the business plan emerges. 
It is simultaneous with the arising of venture capital. So in 1970, there's virtually no venture capital industry. In 1970, we have the need for more entrepreneurs because we've seen gates and we've seen jobs. And we think this is the future. By the way, this is idiosyncratic in many regards. It's a break in history. It is the discovery by Shockley of the transistor. And here's a great question that looms over the future of our economy. Venture capital may have come into existence for one technology. It may have had a second life and a sec second technology, genomics. Is there a third technology? And by the way, speaking of learning curves, venture capitalists still are successful one in seven times. Now they've been at this for five decades. Is there any learning cycle here at all? Casino. They're just betting on ideas with lots of money, hoping it comes to pass. This is the standard business plan articulated in 1990 in the Harvard Business Review. It's got 11 points. And it's a real, real template for how real life works right. Look where it starts. See here? You've got a product description. That's why at the beginning of every school year, you've got your civil engineers running around the campus. They're measuring the chapel steps and the engineering steps, how far above sea level. They do it every year. Thousands of kids do it over the decades. The kids from the business school are walking around looking for opportunity. They're thinking about, ooh, that traffic jam on Saturday for the football game, how can I solve that? I heard somebody couldn't get a hot cookie at 2 a.m. in their dorm room. I can fix that, OK? These are the ideas that generate out of this particular subslice of the population. Not that these kids aren't going to be tremendously creative, but at that moment in life, they're not going to be. So we're shaking the foundations in terms of this Mozart myth. That when it comes to innovation, it's all kids. Not true. Those of you who are mathematicians in the room know that Euler didn't start writing math until he was 65. And we see it more and more and more if we look that people in their 30s and 40s and 50s, or in the case of Mitch with MoviePass, are in their 60s when they're starting these companies, or Fred in his 90s. This is the business plan for Intel. That's the total business plan. It doesn't tell you what the product is. It doesn't tell you how they're going to make money. It doesn't tell you how they're going to raise money. It's a vision statement. See, there are these semiconductors over here. And we're going to somehow make them in ways that we can sort of transform machine-controlled products with these new transistors. That's what this says. That's the Intel business plan. And by the way, I love this business plan because it says what the dream of the company is. And they start. They find their money along the way. They find their market along the way. They find their partners along the way. It's just how business proceeds. You feel your way along. Now here's something that we really don't tell kids. Professors of entrepreneurship are not alert to these data. But it basically says that there's a failure rate, and it looks sort of like this, right? That the number of new firms that survive go down, and that the annual revenue for change goes here. And what it basically says is most firms are dead. 80% of firms are dead by the time they're five years old. This is exceedingly risky. And think about that. Is there a moral dimension to this? We keep encouraging people to go start businesses, start businesses, start businesses with really horrible ideas. I stop, uh, I've stopped judging business plan competitions because I got this close once to standing up amidst a whole set of judges like this and hollering out to a poor student on the stage, do you mean to tell me uh, your professor told you this was a good idea? 80% of people who teach business how to start businesses, professors, have never started a business. Query, 
If you wanted to be a surgeon, would you study with somebody who'd never been in an operating room? Something's really broken here. Well, people know it. So we got new plans as to how to fix it. In the top right, of course, you can do a business can canvas. This is very hot these days, right? So you sort of dream up this business and you paint it out and then it will emerge. It's very much like I like to call this the business Ouija board. Okay, it's not particularly helpful. It tells you that there's some linearity, just like a business plan, and this is how you proceed to do it. Here's a friend of mine at MIT. Okay, uh, he doesn't have an 11 point business plan, it's 24 points. And it's really crooked, looks like a snake. Except, if you pull it out, it's a very linear model. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and success happens. No. Looks more complicated, but it's the same old soap in a different bottle. Here's my real favorite. This guy writes a book that basically says, your intent in starting a plan is to have it, or a business, is to have it all sewn up and sold in four years. And what he does is distill what is one of the negative parts of all this business plan writing and all this teaching and all this venture capital focus. It's the notion of making a new business into a transactional entity. If we go back, see that very last thing over there? Exit strategy. Do you think that was an exit strategy for Procter & Gamble? Do you think there was an exit strategy for Duke Power. Duke Power was created to bring people electricity into the deep and distant future. They weren't creating Duke Power to sell it quick and make a lot of money. It was a service business, as most great businesses are. General Electric and Ford and Chrysler came into existence to make vehicles for people, to obsolete horses, to change the world. And all the companies that survive essentially have to pass that test. Here's a book that's captured a great deal of attention. It's the Lean Startup. But the fact is, Lean Startups are that 1% of software companies. Most businesses are fat startups. You can't start a store without a leasehold, furniture, inventory, a payroll, advertising. That's the typical business. It's fat. It can't be started on a shoestring. Think about MoviePass. We can't start MoviePass on a shoestring. It requires huge amounts of capital. Shockingly, by the way, some days we burn. Our, our burn rate, our daily burn rate, is five, six, and seven million bucks a day. I don't think we can learn anything from the lean startup. I'd like to, but I don't think we can. All right, this makes the last, the penultimate point, and that is, Without a growing economy, it's very tough to start a business. So things right now ought to get better on every frontier, including all the stuff that's clean tech. And the reason is that economists know we have something called adventurous consumers. And when the economy begins to grow, and consumer confidence begins to grow, people are more ready to take risks in what they buy. And the same is true for big business. So if there's new technology, it's much easier to sell innovative solutions to companies that are making more money. So 4% growth is going to be great. And 4% growth will really accelerate our clean tech and the outcome and the focus of all clean tech, and that is making economic energy cleaner and cleaner, just as we have for every year since 1972. Every util of GDP has been made with less energy since 1972. So now we're going to the very last chart, and it shows you one other thing. And this is a real difficult problem. And that is, in the last 10 years, we have loaded up students with student debt. This is depressing business creation, particularly among the younger decades, excuse me, the younger cohorts. And it is a very, very critical problem. I have had people come to me. In fact, one case, an MBA from the Wharton School, virtually weeping that he had a great idea. 
but had to take a job with a major company because he had such a burden of student debt. A real critical issue. So, last thing I want to point out here is how important, and this is the lesson of the book before, big capitalism, uh, bad ca good capitalism, bad capitalism. And what it really makes out is the case that we have big firm, small firm capitalism in the United States. And the way we proceed is these big firms are in fact the real generators of innovation. It's not just universities, sorry to say. Our big firms are huge innovative laboratories because their first constraint is practicality. And the reason I focus on this is these firms are producing about 15% of all brand new startups. Think about Fred Valerino. He walks out of Diebold with a brand new company. And my book tells story after story after story of people in their 40s and 50s leave their companies, love their companies, get frustrated that their companies won't pursue the course they see for them, and in many cases are funded by their companies to go out and start new businesses. And this is in fact how this innovation cycle works. You have internal sources of innovation. I work for several companies in their innovation laboratories. It's critical how much innovation happens in companies. It's how they stay ahead. But we think of them as big, old, mainline companies that can't think and can't get out of their own way. In fact, much of the innovation we enjoy is coming out of these companies. The critical moment is they do synthesis. They do team synthesis. Just like great entrepreneurs are synthetic inside themselves, inside companies, we have team synthesis. This is very poorly understood phenomenon and it requires a great deal of attention by professors, psychologists, uh, economists in the future because this is essentially how it is that we move forward in society. It's converted into practical innovation. That is, it's tested. Does it work or not? And inside the company, we see fast prototyping, something the professors were later to discover has been going on forever. And then essentially it goes to the market, is diffused, and we get customer feedback. Now, by the way, relative to my argument here, two other things are happening. We got market intelligence, basic research, and acquired startups. This is big firm, small firm capitalism. And on the other side, there are breakaway firms that are coming out of these big firms. Hence the phrase, big firm, small firm capitalism. This is critical. And I end by saying three things. First, and one of the mistakes we make is we think we, I think we would have many more if we carried in our head an archetype of who entrepreneurs are. They're people who do this principally and most successfully in mid-career. Second, they've learned a great deal by working in big companies. And one of the things that they learn here, besides all the things I mentioned before in terms of industry knowledge, accounting, the discipline of product development and such like, they learn scale. Now imagine this. A 21-year-old wants to start a business. They even call them lifestyle businesses. I just don't want to work for anybody else. But somebody who's worked in a giant company knows what scale is and can imagine what their contribution can be. And the third thing I want to leave you with is that if, if this is your calling and if you wait till you have a great idea that you're ambushed by an idea that you don't try too hard to have this idea, it's critical that you in fact start to develop this in a cogent, reasonable, sane way. Now what do I mean by all that? Go to people who know how to do this. Maybe go back to work in a business. Find people who have industrial skills. Don't find yourself at the desk in the Small Business Administration asking for guidance from a counselor who last year was a postal inspector. Be very careful who you speak with. Not that you'll share ideas that someone will steal, but talk to people with experience. One of the greatest things about how our country works is we're extremely open. We talk to each other. We look at each other as partners as people who can do this together with a view that we're all going to make this industry, this country, this economy a much better place. 
And the last thing I want to suggest is we still do this more than any other place on Earth, regardless of what professors tell you. I just saw a study that says we're the 18th least innovative country in the world. We start fewer businesses. It's all baloney. We're still at the zenith of innovation, and we still create on a per, basis, a per capita basis more new companies than anybody else. But it's at risk. And one of the things we have to do is essentially get serious about the pragmatic consequences of what we do here and how we do it. Uh, so I guess the best I can say is, for three years I labored to make this a really approachable book. Okay, Lots of what I talked about is in here. I think this is actually a book that makes sense to people. And I encourage you to read it. Thank you.